Greeting from my heart to yours, Shalom, Salam. I am deeply honored to be here today. As you heard, I'm a Pakistani by birth, a Canadian by choice, but let me have, add that I'm a glo global citizen by necessity. I know what it means when we say, stop the world, I want to get off. I live currently under one roof in one home with my mother-in-law, and with my daughter-in-law, <laughs> and I have a beautiful grandson who is half Pakistani and half Mexican, so we call him a Mexipac. <laughs> As you've heard over the uh, hours since yesterday, we live in perilous times, when there's chaos on the world at every level. There are signs that suggest that we've destroyed the environment through our materialism and consumerism and our souls through an overdose of technology. While there are great assets and advantages to technology, especially in the world of art and science and medicine, I don't know if I really want a computer in my brain or a chip under my skin. And sadly, we don't see the same strides in peace building and dialogue building. Look at the world around us added to the tragedy of natural disasters like earthquakes, famines, and floods, are half-insane leaders who have the fingers on a bomb ready to destroy others at any given moment. We need to exchange these weapons of mass destruction with weapons of mass instruction so that we can clear the pathways of, uh, for peace and humanity to find a long-term vision for global solidarity. The good news is that only when we exhaust our physical capacity and have consumed ourselves do we actually respond. We are all inhabitants of one planet and citizens of one world where the lives and well-being of all humanity is inextricably intertwined. So the meaningless meanderings of a bearded man in a cave in Tora Bora resonates right here in the heart of Tel Aviv and Toronto. I believe that as people who affirm the dignity and humanity of all people, we have an individual responsibility as well as the ability to create a world from which injustice, inequality, and oppression are gradually eliminated. We need to be committed to finding other like-minded persons who will work with us to construct the foundations of a justice and compassion-based world in which we can live in peace, and without fear or insecurity. And I don't have to tell you what it means to live in constant fear for your lives and those of your children. Where does this place me as a Muslim woman with a deep connection to my faith, living in the West, and watching with horror as my faith is hijacked and I feel trapped between the extreme right and the extreme left? In Canada, there is a saying that Canadians use. They say, between a rock and a hard place. And that's where I'm placed. However, as a woman of faith, I believe that I will be asked the question, what did I do as an individual when the world was burning? In this sense, it's this sense that every individual can make a difference that brings me back to Israel for the second time within one year and the inspiration that spurs me on to build bridges among communities and individuals and nations. Let me give you a brief idea of how challenge, challenging this journey is. In Pakistan, where I originally come from, most people thrive on conspiracy theories. Everything from an electricity blackout to a delayed train is either a US, Zionist, or Indian conspiracy. <laughs> there's, um, there's an urgent need to change this mindset because it chokes growth and development. And this warped thinking allows our youth to become cannon fodder for religious mercenaries who prey on their fears and insecurities. Today, as I see death and destruction engulf my land of birth, I'm saddened but spurred on all the more to work for peace. Since I moved to Canada 20 years ago, I've traveled back to Pakistan at least once a year to remove the cobwebs from the eyes of our youth and to tell them that Pakistan was created around the same time and of almost similar ideology as Israel. And how would they feel if their neighbors refused to acknowledge their existence? I impart this message to our Canadian youth as well because I believe that they and us, we have a lot to learn from Israel. I also see 
that hate and racism are taught at home. So we must begin at a very grassroots level to strip away the layers of suspicion. And to this effect, I'm very happy to say that I work closely with my friends in the Jewish community of Toronto. And it's actually my partner in interfaith dialogue, Rabbi Jordan Cohen of Temple Anshe Shalom, from whom I learned the term tikkun olam. Am I saying it correctly? And with him, together, we are doing a little bit individually to start repairing the world. But for this, I've been called a Zionist agent, which I take as a great compliment. <laughs> and today, my presence here, my presence here today just confirms their worst fears and insecurities. So I continue to put this on Facebook, by the way. <laughs> so from, but, but for me, standing here in Jerusalem, where brotherhood and blood have been a historical reality, where the three Abrahamic faiths find their roots, I'm reminded again and again of the verse from the Quran that inspires my work ethic. Humanity is but one community. And also, I read as a very young child where God has said that we have created you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. It has allowed me to say that I'm not a complete Muslim until I'm also partly Jewish and Christian. And sadly, this beautiful notion is quickly drowned out by the thundering sound of a suicide bomber. So my second challenge is to detract the doctrine of armed jihad, which many Muslims naively hold dear and accept as one of the pillars of faith today. Therefore, they have no qualms about using violence against those who disagree with their ideology whether they are Muslim or not. This is the theory that I challenge in my book, Their Jihad, Not My Jihad, and this is an ongoing debate within the progressive Muslim community all over the world. My book also is a scathing critique of Wahhabi ideology, for which I have the honor of a fatwa for critiquing my fellow religionists, because I've always held that I must clean up my house before I criticize yours. As a Muslim, it's embarrassing to accept the bullying and buffoon represented by some of our leaders, especially at the United Nations. It seems historically that short, funny-looking men have always tried to bully and oppress the Jewish nation. <laughs> Iran's, Iran's nuclear proliferation is a threat not only to the existence of Israel, but to the image of Muslims globally. And I know I have one minute left, but you have to take out time for the applause, so I'm going to take an extra minute. Moreover, the so theatrics. Don't draw more applause. Okay. Yes, please. Moreover, the theatrics of some, Mus some leaders detract from the positive work being done by many Muslims to defray the damage done by extremists. Do you wonder when, then, why I want the world to stop and jump off? But that's the coward's way. And I found that there are positive ways to bring about change. I also happen to be an eternal optimist. And I know that there is faith in human beings. I've discovered in my spiritual journey that from Kabbalah to Sufism, all wisdom teaches us that one individual can bring about change. Gandhi said, become the change you want to see. Now some of this work in change has to come from one half of the Muslim world that has been kept silent and under covers. And it is my greatest passion. It is my life's work to work in women's rights and education. As Susan Rice eloquently pointed out last night, we believe that if you educate one boy, you educate an individual. If you educate one woman, you educate first an entire village and then a nation. So education and enlightenment. <laughs> education and enlightenment of my sisters in faith is a strong component of the work that I'm doing. And I'm delighted to share with you many of the insights and changes coming from uh, within the Muslim world are the women who are working. And for these Muslim women like me, this work involves great sacrifices and hostile responses. While we are activists, we are also mothers, daughters, wives, friends, and grandmothers. When these women become leaders, I assure you there will be more peace in the world. Look at the women who were leaders, like Golda Meir, Benazir Bhutto, Indra Gandhi, and Margaret Thatcher. They had great capacities to bring about change. However, our patriarchal masses still don't easily accept women in leadership positions, and so women are being thrust back. So one thing we have to do is to educate our, our young women and to empower them to bring about change. And while I don't want to take up too much time, I want to just mention very quickly that tomorrow is for our youth, who are the most 
precious resource of this planet. So we have to ask ourselves, are we going to teach them hate and violence or are we going to give them the tools to bring about change from within? Because the peace we are desperately looking for is something that we have to instill in ourselves before we can speak to others. And I'll end. And I'll end now with the words, poignant, poignant words of Alice Walker, another Walker who said, this is how change happens though. It's a relay race and we are very conscious of that. Our job really is to do our part in the race and then pass it on, and then someone picks it up and keeps on going. And this is how it is. And we can do this as a planet with the consciousness that we may not get it, you know, today, but there's always a tomorrow. To that. <laughs>